Greetings everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the 2025 initiative, Preparing the Way, Sagittarius Solar Festival webinar. My name is Alexander Ilchuk and I am greeting you on the behalf of the Initiatives Coordination Group. Today's topic of our focus and our conversation will be the future of international cooperation and the role of the United Nations. And um, the theme is very appropriate for Sagittarius with its focused energy on a goal. And before we go into our work today, let's have an alignment. Focus within yourself, bringing attention to the soul. Connect with people joining our webinar, coming from around the world. Visualizing connection as bright light connecting our hearts and minds through space. And we unite in the group heart center, in the center of our circle. And we extend our alignment further, connecting with the new group of world servers, visualizing it as a network of light covering the entire planet. And we align with the centers of the new group of world servers. And through the centers of the group, we bring our alignment up towards the heart center of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet the Christ. And we bring our alignment further, projecting the connection to the far center where the will of God is known, Shambhala.
and from here we bring our focus to humanity. And we visualize the all three centers, hierarchy, Shambhala, and humanity, being connected in a triangle formation with energy freely circulating between each of the centers. And we bring our focus back to the centers of the new group of world servers, standing as a medium between the hierarchy and humanity. We connect with the new group of world servers. And together we sound the mantra of the new group of world servers. May the power of the one life pour through the group of all true servers. May the love of the one soul characterize the lives of all who seek to aid the great ones. May we fulfill our part in the one work through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, and the right speech. Welcome again, and with this I want to pass the microphone to our guest, Marco Toscano Rivalto. Marco? Yes, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today, Marco. And yeah, it's a very important topic at this point, and we're all connected in our meditation, keeping the light for our planet. And um, thank you for agreeing to keep the focus on this topic today and share your thoughts and ideas and lead us in meditation. So the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sasha. And uh, thank you uh, to all of you who have joined the, uh, the webinar from all over the planet. Um, my name is uh, my, my name is Marco uh, Toscano Rivalta, and today basically I would like to share with you, um, you know, some personal thoughts and, and uh, feelings about what's happening in the world today, and in particular concerning uh, international cooperation and the role of the nations. Um, I'm, I'm sharing this on the basis of my experience in working with the United Nations for a number of years now, um, both uh, in, New in New York and in Geneva, but also in uh, some of the countries 
around this beautiful planet. Um, and so for it's, it's really a privilege to be uh, to be with you. Um, and also beg for your indulgence because <laughs> today is is the first time ever that I do a webinar. So I, I hope I'll, do, um, I'll come through um, clear. But if I'm not, please just uh, let me know, and I'll be more than happy to adjust my uh, my way of speaking. Um, certainly, when Sasha uh, and, uh, proposed me uh, to do this uh, this intervention today, um, immediately I said yes. I was uh, super excited. And then I started thinking that maybe I had exaggerated in my, in my self-confidence because uh, to speak uh, to the question of the future of international cooperation, uh, one needs to have a, a rather <laughs> longer term view. Um, so that's why um, today what I would like to do is uh, just to, to discuss with you, uh, to discuss together a few options on how, as uh, as humanity, as human beings, we can move uh, forward together, but also on the basis of the experience that uh, um, other human beings before us uh, uh, um, have taken us where we are today. Uh, so, basically, the future of international cooperation is built uh, on a very strong uh, um, and rather enlightened past. Uh, so our, our job today in the present is really to capitalize on what has been done in the past and plant the seed uh, for, for, the, for the future work uh, um, ahead of us. Now, um, maybe what I could start is, is from uh, um, a few points around the, uh, the United Nations. Um, there's a lot of discussions uh, nowadays around the United Nations, uh, what it is, what it does, and what I would like to do is, is, is uh, basically to look at the United Nations uh, today, not necessarily from the perspective of an international organization only, but fundamentally through uh, the, the founding uh, idea that in uh, 1945, was basically planted in, in the consciousness of, uh, of humanity. I'm placing really a lot of emphasis on 1945, which is the founding year of the United Nations, because I truly believe that it, 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 it signal and it signifies a, a, a major turning point in the evolution of, uh, of humanity. Again, I'm not speaking about the organization per se, but about the idea which is behind the, the, the funding uh, the funding of the United Nations. Now, the, the, the idea of the United Nations is not new. Um, some, some time ago, uh, when I was uh, still uh, studying, I came across uh, a very interesting book uh, which uh, presented and discussed uh, different forms of alliances that had been uh, established over the past uh, 4,000 years. So clearly we can see that uh, the idea of cooperation is something that doesn't belong uh, to us, and we, of course we know that, but it's something that has been uh, gradually evolving uh, over, over the years, over the centuries and the millennia. And that uh, gradual evolution goes hands in hands with uh, the uh, evolution of human consciousness. Um, now, what happened really in 1945 is that uh, um, the major really point of departure from the past was that for the first time ever, in uh, at least as far as I know, uh, in the history of humanity, we moved from a system of alliances to uh, preserve peace and security 
to, a, to an alliance which was looking at not only peace and security, but also development. Uh, and therefore, this, this, word, this word development was uh, basically brought into the core of uh, international relations and international cooperation. And uh, now today we, we speak about development in rather uh, almost like usual terms. It's a very common, it's a very common words, but in fact, uh, is it's, it's rather new in in our common language um, because uh, what really happened in 1945 was. Uh, um, the writing down the understanding that uh, in order to move uh, forward, not only we had to protect ourselves uh, from each other, but in fact we had to cooperate in order to tackle together common challenges. And that is really a major, a major thing, and I intentionally place a lot of emphasis on that, because uh, that becomes the context in which uh, um, our discussions today takes place and also where uh, the future is taking us. 2015 um, has been a very important year from a global perspective in terms of the uh, planting the seeds for the future of, of international cooperation. We have had uh, uh, um, to date uh, three major international conferences uh, the first one was in March in Japan, uh, which looked at uh, the question of cooperations around uh, uh, prevention of, of, of disasters. We had one in Addis Abeba in July, which was around the financing for development. We just had in New York in September uh, the new uh, sustainable development agenda. Uh, with the adoption of the goals and the targets, and then uh, we are getting ready in, in uh, for the beginning in ten days uh, of uh, the um, conference uh, in Paris on climate. So the, the, this year has been quite a critical one in terms of planting the seeds uh, uh, for for the future of of, um, of international cooperation, and. Uh, this planting the seed and, and the, uh, is, is basically built around uh, a, a rather simple idea. <laughs> it's, it's simple as an idea, but then it is, it's, 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 it's quite beautiful and articulated when it comes to uh, understanding and grasping uh, uh, with, its, uh, with its different aspects. This idea is, is the one related to collective decision making and, and that is really what uh, in 1945 we committed to. Uh, we committed to learn how to collectively decide what could, uh, what could be good for humanity and to act upon it. Um, if we look at the United Nations from this perspective, then we can imagine that uh, one immediately can say that the United Nations is not 70 years old, but it's probably 70 years young, uh, because uh, it's, it's, a rather, it's a rather challenging endeavor, the one that we've just, uh, we've just embarked for the past 70 years. Now, we are all familiar with the difficulties of uh, of, of deciding. I'm sure that if now Sasha proposed us uh, to go out for dinner or for lunch or for breakfast together and we had to decide what to eat and where to go, it would take quite a while uh, uh, to, to combine all our different interests, ideas and preferences. So you can imagine when that is brought to, to planetary scale and, and where we had to uh, by consensus, because this is the quite interesting modalities through which the United Nations operate, to decide what to do and then actually do it, uh, do it together. Now, the, 
this experiment is, is, is just started and uh, it's I think it's quite important to understand uh, it's uh, the implication of this to bring uh, that symbol United Nations within ourselves and see what it means for for a human being to be part of a collective decision making what it takes on, on each of us in terms of aspirations, wishes, um, our integrity, our vision, our uh, uh, purpose, and so on and so forth. And, and we can clearly immediately see that uh, the basically the nature of human consciousness becomes quite an interesting key to understand the international relations and international cooperation. In a way, globalization in itself uh, is, 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 which is another very common word nowadays, is something which is definitely not uh, related to our era. One could probably trace uh, globalization back uh, to the origin of the planet, because uh, increasingly uh, our ancestors have been moving uh, um, around the planet, um, becoming more and more familiar with it, with the other kingdoms, and then uh, also looking beyond uh, the planetary boundaries in themselves, realizing that we were part of a, made of, of a larger scheme of things, including a solar system and beyond. So the, the, the question of globalization is fundamentally an enlargement, uh, and, and I put it as almost as a, a, a stimulation, as an enlargement of uh, the, the consciousness of, uh, of humanity in itself. And here it becomes uh, quite interesting then to see the relations which exist between the consciousness of humanity as a being in itself uh, with the consciousness of the individuals which belong to that, uh, to that humanity. Now, to grasp the space that uh, the human consciousness embraces, we do require human beings to cooperate. Because uh, one will be maybe an expert in understanding the relations with the animal kingdom. Another one will be an expert in understanding the relation with uh, the vegetable kingdoms. Another will be an expert in understanding the relation between the planet and the sun and the, sun and the other planets. So it's, it's only by joining our collective understanding that we can gra grasp uh, really the extension of this uh, globalization and, and, and the potentials within it. So in, the, in this context we can also see that uh, the future of international cooperation has been moving, and we can trace this back, uh, especially from the beginning of the United Nations, from a, a cooperation that had uh, as at the center of interest only and exclusively, I would say, the interest of human beings and their needs, to a cooperation that is focused on understanding the needs of the planet as a whole. And that, again, is, is a rather new endeavor. Um, for, for each of us individually taken, uh, certainly it is for me personally, is a major, major uh, challenge every single day to understand the, the context in which I'm operating. You know, I, I, I work with an office that deals with the prevention of, 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 uh, of disasters. And understanding how this uh, area of business is connected to other areas of business, uh, whether it's development, uh, humanitarian relief, uh, the different sciences that are involved, uh, it's really it's really a major a major challenge that goes beyond my mental capacity, I would say, but it really enters into the question of my of the capacity of my consciousness to understand that what are the different relations across. Uh, uh, different human beings, uh, different sciences, uh, uh, a different path of life, and the impact that it exists uh, uh, between our common actions 
and as a whole with humanity, with the other kingdom of natures, which uh, in a way bring also forward the question of what is really the role of humanity uh, vis-a-vis the other uh, kingdom of nature. Uh, we normally call uh, uh, the other kingdoms resources, uh, but then I, I always wonder whether humanity and each single human being, certainly starting for myself, if Marco can be considered a resource for the other kingdoms? Am I a resource for the plants around me? Am I a resource for the animals around me? And am I a resource for the other human beings around me? So it really places us as, as humans uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rather new, the rather new space that needs to be uh, uh, fully un understood. But here again, uh, uh, we are not alone in, in these efforts to understand the, uh, to understand the, uh, the, the work that needs to be uh, undertaken. In fact, uh, in the uh, Charter of the United Nations, in particular in Article 1, there is a, a, a very powerful description of uh, uh, what is the purpose of the organization. And the purpose is articulated in four, in four points. The first one is about uh, uh, preserving peace and, uh, and security. Uh, the second one is about the friendly relations uh, among nations and uh, the respect of, of, uh, of human rights. The third one is around uh, basically the international cooperation for developments to tackle the, the, the common challenges ahead. And the fourth one, which I believe is really the core of the essence of the United Nations, it says uh, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations in the attainment of the common good. Now, if we stop for a second and, 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 and we pause and we concentrate um, our minds and, and our consciousness of what being a center for harmonizing the actions of nations entails, I think that a new, a new field, a new gate really opens ahead of us. Uh, what does it mean to be a center for harmonizing actions? What does it entail? What characteristics this center needs to have? Is it possible to be a center for harmonizing actions? Am I capable to harmonize my own actions. So we can clearly see that uh, in, in that very simple liner in Article 1.4 of the United Nations Charter, there is a, a major leap forward in terms of the future of international cooperation. So reflecting on some of these questions concerning around what uh, a center for the uh, harmonizing actions is, means, and entails, we can start identifying some, some of the key characteristics of uh, the work that we as individuals and also as collective we need to, to, uh, to undertake. Um, but I think also that the, uh, the future of international cooperation doesn't stop it doesn't stop here. Um, there are many other aspects that uh, the, the, very, the very fact that we have the United Nations uh, brings to us. Some time ago I was asking myself, uh, uh, again, a rather simple question, which was why the United Nations in 1945 and not in 2784 or in 945. And, and of course, uh, um, I don't claim to have the answer to that, 
but that pushed me to 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 realize that uh, it was probably not by coincidence that the United Nations came into existence uh, in this specific uh, time conjuncture. Uh, it meant to me that uh, the consciousness of humanity was ready for that experiment. It means that probably wasn't ready um, a thousand years ago, but we were ready now. And 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 that readiness uh, basically uh, come comes along with a number of uh, of interesting considerations because. Uh, if we look at the history of the planet over the past uh, 600 years, I think that we can also find some interesting elements uh, of this evolutionary process that we are witnessing. Uh, it is not uh, until uh, the 15th century that humanity discovers to be on one planet. Uh, we had maybe certain individuals which already thousands of years ago understood that we were on a sphere, on a planet, but it is only uh, six, uh, 15, uh, 15 and, um, sorry, uh, 500 years ago that we realized uh, that uh, we were on one single planet as humanity. So this, in a way, symbolized the emergence of the uh, of, of, of the body of uh, of humanity. We realized that we were one on this planet. Then, a few hundred years go by, and science, at the uh, you know around the 19th century, uh, brings to us uh, the understanding that. Uh, and, and Albert Einstein definitely uh, was a major lighthouse in this, uh, in this sense. To correlate mass with energy and basically uh, demonstrate that there is a, a sort of an etheric body, a body of energy that is uh, connected to, uh, to matter. And I don't think it's just by pure coincidence that in the very same years, uh, also, the uh, electricity uh, start acquiring a, a quite a wide, uh, a wide application. Um, then the evolution continues, and it is uh, definitely with uh, World War One and World War Two that we, as collective humanity, we realize to be. Uh, to constitute uh, one single uh, body from an emotional point of view, in the sense that uh, uh, the repercussion on the emotional body or of, the, of the suffering of the, uh, of the of the two wars were really felt uh, throughout the planet, and therefore uh, uh, signaling the the oneness of humanity from a, from an emotional body point of view. Now. If one takes, uh, you know, this evolution from a, a physical body, an ethical body, an emotional body, and we draw a parallel with uh, a physical body of a human being, an etheric body of a human being, an emotional body of a human being, it becomes quite uh, um, evident that a question could be do we have a mental body as, as humanity? Do we have the evidence of that? And here again, I think that the, the coming into existence of the United Nations does represent the emergency of, of the signal of the existence of a collective mind. In fact, the United Nations in itself as an organization, got tasked with the duty to uh, identify forms for the welfare of humanity, modalities for the welfare of humanity, new ideas for the welfare of humanity. So literally the construction of thought forms 
which would lead humanity from a certain situation to another to another situation uh, and a better one. So clearly, clearly the the, the work of the United Nations, uh, uh, not in, as an organization, but as a collective body made of human beings, which is not only state representatives not only functionary of the organizations, but actually every single human being uh, with, with a strong goodwill can actually participate into that, uh, into that collective uh, endeavor. And in fact, uh, those uh, uh, conferences that I mentioned before that took place in 20, 2015, they do represent uh, this emergence of a collective thinking, they do represent uh, the emergence of an international rhythm, and we do know for a fact that uh, creative thinking and rhythmic thinking is at the basis of uh, the creative capacity of, uh, of mankind. Um, then, definitely also the emergence of this Center for Harmonizing Nations of Nations um, is, quite, uh, is quite close as an idea to the center that uh, we we do we all have experience of within ourselves. We, we we all know that we we have we are a center within ourselves, and that center now has been also projected into uh, into the collective reality of mankind to, to the point that has been even materialized through uh, a, a very strong idea called. Uh, United Nations, and now that idea is, uh, you know, step by step, error by error, being embodied uh, into uh, a system of, uh, of international relations, a system of international cooperation. Uh, another important, uh, another important aspect of the work uh, that is taking place within the uh, auspices of the United Nations is. Uh, the appreciation of the value for and of law. Now, one could argue, well, why do I bring law here? And I think that law is, is quite an important, uh, is quite an important uh, um, tool, but also the, uh, is the expression of quite a significant power, the creative power of humanity. Different sciences, they tell us that the, um, the planet, I mean, in nature, uh, uh, there, there is a full body of different, of different laws. So in a way, the humanity, uh, through the legislative capacity, is learning how to channel and master its own creative power. Because we do know for a fact that law and laws are instrument to take uh, a given society from one point uh, to the other is uh, is an instrument uh, by which human beings imagine and organize relations and rhythm within a system within a group and therefore it becomes i would say the manifestation of the purpose of that very specific group so Appreciating, and it's not by coincidence that uh, under the auspices of the of international of the United Nations, there is a massive increase of uh, um, of international law, and uh, uh, queen of all is uh, the uh, international human rights law, which is the rights of human relation of, 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 of right human uh, of right human relations, and now. Also through environmental law, we are understanding the relations not only amongst humans but also between humans and uh, and the planet and the other kingdom of of nature. So, if we do appreciate uh, the the um, the question of, of law and its value, and and we and by analogy we appreciate also the the laws and the principles that the uh, ancient wisdom takes to us, we actually 
can start uh, understanding and, and identifying the fact that there is a sort of a, of a spiritual dimension of the rule of law. Because it's just the capacity of humanity to appreciate that there is a wider system of laws that we need to learn how to use and then through our own legislative capacity enact a system uh, and body a society which is capable of expressing the plan that it does exist on uh, on the planet and for the planet. So there are, I can say, there are many many dimensions through which we can look at the question of the future of international cooperation and the role of the United Nations. But definitely a core a core funding element is this our capacity to collectively think is our capacity to collectively imagine uh, what the future needs to be, how to get there, so devise a plan, a collective plan to get there, and actually enact it. And in this, the power of creative thinking is really is really critical. Um, and now, getting toward the uh, the conclusion of this sharing of a, of, of a few a few ideas. I think it's interesting to recall that uh, uh, a major uh, psychologist whose name is Roberto Assagioli, uh, in, in the 70s, after a lifetime of studies, uh, wrote a, quite an interesting book uh, around uh, will, which was called, which is called the act of will. Now, learning how to use will definitely is something that is fundamentally in our hands as individuals and is definitely something which is at the core of the idea of being a center for harmonizing actions. Whether those actions are my personal actions or are the actions of a collective, will is always at the center and therefore the importance for us to study will, to see what it is, to see how it works, to explore its qualities and potentials, and how to collectively use it, I think is a fundamental step that we all need to embark on. And the use of will and the use of mind is connected to a second point that I want to make, which is the one of creative thinking and meditation. And uh, I don't think it's by coincidence that the second Secretary General of the United Nations, Doug Hammarskjöld, had built had it built within the UN building in New York a, a, a meditation room, where he invited people from all over the planet to send the, the, through the power of their thoughts the vision for the future of humanity. So. That is a, a very strong ongoing experiment that was initiated by a Secretary General himself. So again, the power of thought and, 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 and the use of will, they come to the fore quite strongly when, when we speak in, uh, about the future of international corporations and the role of the United Nations. I would probably stop here, Sasha. I think I've shared a lot of uh, a lot of uh, points, and then I'll be more than happy to uh, to further expand, but also to hear uh, what are the views uh, and ideas of the other friends on the uh, on the webinar. Because we all, as human beings, we do have experience of will, we do have experience of uh, uh, collective thinking, we do have experience of of corporations, and therefore I think it's a great opportunity to uh, to just share our own experiences here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. And uh, I just invite uh, everyone who on the webinar to join this sharing and uh, contribute your ideas and thoughts, and or we'll bring up. Uh, a question uh, to everyone's attention 
And to do, in order to do that, please um, use the function raise your hand. Uh, it's a, a button your control panel, uh, and I will unmute you. Or alternatively, you can uh, write your comment or a question in the question section of the control panel. And um, while we wait for first um, comments, I just uh, again want to thank you, Marco, for this clear, uh, structured vision of the evolution of international cooperation. And uh, it's very uh, new for me, frankly, to see it that way, but I definitely see that this progression, I probably would add to this uh, progression from physical, etheric to emotional, levels of connectivity in humanity and mental as the, U the United Nations, I would see that the progression of the mental connectivity that we live in through, it's been creation of the internet and as a symbol of collective mind. And it's uh, I see it as a definite expansion uh, for everyone in terms of understanding the unity between ourselves. And that's, a, for me, is also a symbol of bringing the idea of United Nations to the next level, which is the United Nations as they originally were seen. It's not just an, uh, not an organization, but the, the nations that are united. So that's the this idea of connectedness and standing together. So that's my uh, impression that came while I've been listening. There is a question um, from uh, Jeannie Ross. Is it your experience that the majority of the workers of the United Nations are sincere in the task of international cooperation, or are they greatly motivated by private agendas? So, Marco, this is a question for you. Yes. Um, Maybe, um, Sasha, tell me how you would like uh, uh, to go, whether I should address this question and share further thoughts, or we want to uh, wait for other questions as well. I think or we even can, other ideas. So. I think, yeah, we can just go with, uh, with the flow and as questions uh, arrive. If there will be several, I will read them in a row and then... Uh, you would answer them, but yeah, maybe you can start with this. Um, look, my my very personal take is that uh, I'm, I am definitely impressed by uh, the overwhelming uh, m majority in term in terms of goodwill and and and, and well motivated people. Um, Agendas always exist, um, and uh, they also exist uh, in our personal choices. I mean, if I go back to the uh, to the ideas of uh, um, of going out for dinner together, uh, definitely I may propose a place that is closer to my place because it's my interest maybe to come home earlier, or maybe if I don't have too much money and I can't spend money in fuel in this specific moment, I prefer to go to a place where maybe I can even buy it too. So there are always, uh, uh, I would say, personal agendas. And personal agendas or partisans' agendas are not in and of themselves uh, bad by default. They're simply, more often than not, the simple representation of an interest 
of a point of view. And here again is the connectedness with uh, the, um, the question of uh, the evolution of consciousness. So individual consciousness and, and uh, I have come in, in this job, I really have come to have a strong appreciation and, and admirations for the diplomats in themselves for the simple reasons that you try to imagine yourself sitting in the, in the assembly room of the, uh, of the United Nations, in the General Assembly, representing the, all the interests of your country, whether it is about peace and security, environment, administration, relief, and so on and so forth. It's quite a tough job. Um, so you, you, you can imagine that the, the endeavor in terms of collective decision making does go through individual consciousnesses and therefore inevitably you have a, a, a partial representation of reality. It's, it's, just, it's just a fact. Um, so in, what I've come to, uh, what I've come to, uh, to appreciate is that is the fact that uh, you know, even in the context of international cooperation, uh, individual or, 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 or sectoral agenda are not uh, are, are not a problem really, uh, uh, and more often than not, they can become even even resources. Whether there are spoilers, you know, yes, of course, we we know for a fact that there are, but I think that overwhelmingly, I. If uh, we have the United Nations today, is that in spite of uh, probably many attempts to derail the ideas, humanity in 1945, and I would say exactly during the worst period of the world of World War II, a bunch of individuals came together between 1941 and 1945, and they conceived an organization which was building on uh, an existing one, at that time the League of Nations, which was deemed to have been a failure. And in spite of that perception, in spite of the war, in spite of the horrible moments that humanity was going through, so I would say the, the apex of the railers, the United Nations was created. And it took, it took humanity to a, a new, complete le a completely new level in terms of uh, of international cooperation. So I, I, I still remain quite uh, uh, quite positive about it. And I would say that there is a, there is a further evolution taking place, is that uh, cooperation is no longer uh, only amongst nations. Uh, it's become a cooperation that is uh, entails individuals, entails corporations, entails many other factors. So the job of, of states and state representatives is becoming increasingly difficult and there is where we need to help them. Because uh, states are no longer, I would say, the owners of the United Nations, but have become the trustees on behalf of the people of the United Nations. And that also is a quite new and challenging uh, uh, dimensions where we are all responsible for. We cannot just expect diplomats uh, to, to do this if we as individuals don't uh, represent the same collective will, the same goodwill uh, in, in our daily, daily work. Thank you. Um, just a uh follow-up question on what you just said, but would you envision the transformation of the United Nations from uh, the government representation body to uh, a body that includes more wider circle of um, societies, of the nations itself? Um. Well, I would say that uh, well, it's quite interesting because uh, uh, the ideas of transforming or reforming the United Nations was born, uh, I think, the same day in which the United Nations came into existence. I mean, you can trace back uh, 
discussion to reform the United Nations already in the 40s. Um, but I think that that is good because uh, if, an, if an entity uh, is conceived and created to be an agent of change, and it is in nature an agent of change, in itself that agent needs to change in order to remain ahead of the curve. So transformation is definitely an ongoing, uh, an ongoing and needed, uh, and needed exercise. The point is uh, whether we just focus on the form, so transformation, whether we just uh, keep ourselves busy in changing its uh, organizational structure, or actually we can focus also a bit more on what is the very essence of the organization. And I go back to the point of Article 1.4 of the UN Charter that says to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations for the attainment of the common good. Now, focusing on that is really, in my personal opinion, the core, the essence, because uh, it's it, it, the transformation of the organizations at that stage, uh, from that perspective, will evolve s as long as individuals evolve, as long as we collectively as humanity evolve in terms of becoming ourselves center for harmonizing our own actions to start with. And the organization of this action means the harmonizing our own actions in light to our personal uh, purpose, I mean the purpose that our higher, higher purpose. Now, from the form side, it is also a fact that there has been a major transformation in the decision-making process of the organization, and it is moving from being a decision-making machinery among states representatives only to a machinery that at the moment register two other fundamental parties civil society and independent uh, independent experts. Now, of course, it's an organization that was created and funded by states, so states still play the primary role, but it is also true that uh, in every single process that I've been involved with, including uh, uh, direct engagement uh, into the organization of the uh, Third World Conference in Japan on Disaster Risk Reduction, the one of the, the first of the four of this of this year. The civil society also has played a fundamental role uh, in terms of being, uh, of the outcome document of the World Conference. So you can tell that, uh, and there are very important discussions in New York in these days, precisely on how to widen the uh, the participation of civil society. Into this, uh, into this decision-making process. Now, of course, it's not, uh, it's not fast. Of course, uh, some may, many may feel frustrated that it's not moving as fast as it should. Uh, but it's also a fact that, hey, 70 years ago, none of the things that we're discussing today were even vaguely on, uh, on the horizon. So again, if I look at the perspective, I mean, it was quite interesting. When I started to do this job with, this, with the United Nations, I was speaking with my grandmother at that time, who was born in the, uh, the early days of the, of the 20th century. And for her, this question of international civil service was something that simply did not exist until uh, this Days. So when I was telling her that I wanted to work for the United Nations to be an international civil servant, she I still remember her beautiful smile looking at me like, what are you really talking about? Because, and that for me was quite an important measure because uh, you could tell that within the lifespan of a human being, in that sense my mother was my grandmother, uh, who actually had gone through two world wars, something major had happened. Um, so I still believe that, uh, and that's why I become more and more confident that within our own lifespan, we can achieve major things. We, we, uh, the transformation that we're talking about is massive. 
but it is also true that there is a massive involvement of a huge number of goodwill people that are strongly determined to make uh, evolutions go forward. So definitely we will see more transformation and, and widening of the participation of uh, uh, civil society and other actors so that the member state can play more and more this role of trustees that I, that I mentioned before. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I will unmute. Uh, I'm unmuting Uta. Uta Gabi. Hi, Uta. Hello. Hello, everyone. Marco, thank you very much, first of all, for this uh, really lucid and heartfelt, wise presentation about the United Nations. Um, touched me very deeply. And um, I would like um, to know a bit more about one thing that you said. National human consciousness is a key to understanding international relations. Um, I would like to know two things about this. One is, uh, when you spoke before about the diplomats uh, having to represent their, their nations and how difficult, how complex this is, my question is, um, can one that work, if one works, when one works in the United Nations, does the soul of a nation or the character of a nation shine through these diplomats? Can you say, ah, this guy comes from this and this country, uh, I can recognize, um, I don't know, the ray of this, uh, the rays of, of this uh, uh, nation or the level of development of consciousness of this nation. Um, this is one question. And the other question is, uh, as we are all part of our own nation, uh, what can we do as an individual and maybe as part of a spiritual group to um, uh, to strengthen the soul of a nation? That's it. Uh, ciao, Uta. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. Um, you, you are asking uh, uh, very uh, important and challenging questions. Um, I'll try to to address some of these aspects now. On the on on, on the parallel that I draw between uh, the, the nations and human consciousness, uh, um, um, I think I was inspired by uh, again um, this uh, this uh, psychologist Roberto. Asajoli, who in one of his books was describing how we are made of different parts within ourselves. And you know, the, the, these parts are also the different roles that we play in our daily life. You know, we are, uh, in my case, I'm a son, uh, I'm a husband, uh, I'm a brother, I'm a colleague, I'm an Italian, I'm an international civil servant and so on and so forth. Uh, all of these are different aspects, all of these are different components that have their own interest. You know, the, the macro civil servants may have a different interest than um, the macro who likes to play some game with friends or the, the mark that likes to go out and being in nature. Because if I have to be in the office, I cannot be in nature, of course. Now, the same, so this uh, articulation and sometimes fragmentation of different parts is also what we witness uh, in the context of international cooperation. I would say that international cooperation, international relations is a beautiful mirror of what is happening within ourselves. I think that doing this job and having the privilege and the opportunity to be constantly exposed to these different interests play, uh, playing out uh, in my uh, in front of me allows me to see much more clearly 
what are the inner games that are going on within myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, then I can also recognize that there are ways in which I can uh, move from fragmentation of interest to an harmonization of those interests. And therefore, that also gives me the energy and the determination to understand that the same things can also be achieved on a, on a, on a planetary scale uh, through humanity as a whole. So, because nations in themselves can be considered as different, as different parts. Uh, civil society is expressed in certain parts. Business is expressed in certain parts. So, all, all of those parts, they, they do have a mirror within, uh, within ourselves. So, ourselves are both the solutions as, 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 as well as the, uh, the playground uh, that articulates the existing reality that we witness. Across, uh, across the globe. Uh, definitely, there are many things that we can do uh, as individuals. I, th I, I truly believe that meditation is quite an important one, uh, and, and uh, that also, uh, uh, that's why when I even saw for the first time the meditation room at the United Nations built by Doug Amershaw, I realized how strong and clear was in his mind, his Dagamashal mind, the understanding that the power of, of thought that is coming from individuals across the goal, oriented toward a common goal, uh, how powerful that is. Uh, so meditation is connecting to the, to the, to the overall core that we have been the, of, of values and questions that we have been discussing today, I think is fundamental. Now, to your point on whether I, you know, the soul of the nations playing out through individuals, uh, I'm not there yet myself. Uh, so I, I, myself, I don't think uh, I'm <laughs> can be considered as a representative of the, of the soul of Italy, so to say. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. fully aware of the of the limitations that uh, um, uh, that my eyes, uh, uh, what my consciousness says when I, when I witness this, uh, this, this phenomena. Uh, but definitely, uh, if not in its entirety, definitely we belong to a certain nation, we belong to a certain group, we bring forward those qualities, we bring, we bring forward those characteristics. And that's why then cooperation again becomes important because it's, it's, it's a merging of these different, uh, different interests, so to say, different uh, ideas. So, mm. so I think I think that this is is, is, is just an ongoing uh, an ongoing process. So that in itself brings us another additional element of what we can do as individuals. I mean, to make a, a, a conscious and determined efforts in linking uh, not only to the global consci consciousness of humanity, not only to the global consciousness of, of the planet as a whole, but also with, with the consciousness of our nations, of our city. Uh, so it, uh, 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 am I a genuine representative of this? Or, or that is even a, to a difficult question. Uh, simply would be, you know what I can do, what I can be, in order to embody the values that uh, this entity, city, this entity, nations has to offer to to others. Mm -hmm. And and maybe uh, one interesting study could be, you know, if we look at uh, the ancient wisdom, tell us many things about colors, and I've been always intrigued. By the idea of doing a study on uh, on, on the colors of the flags of countries mm. to see what is the resonance between uh, the purpose of a nation, uh, the spirit of a nation, and and the colors that have been chosen for 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 her flag. Hmm. This may tell us a bit more even about the soul of the nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Asa Jolie has written a little bit only about psychosynthesis of a nation 
um, they find it fascinating to to use this really as you said to to link not only to the global consciousness in a general way but uh, to try to intuit uh, um, the higher levels of consciousness of the nation we are in and uh, trying to be the best um, manifestation or expression of this. So, sorry, Sasha, should I... Oh. Um, yes, no, I, I think that the, the uh, the work of Asajoli or the, the, the psychosynthesis of nations is uh, is definitely an, an area of work. I, I've seen that actually at the beginning of the uh, of the century. I mean, not this century, the other one. Uh, also, had us uh, had written around uh, the psychology of of peoples uh, and so on and so forth. So there was something quite important at the beginning. Of the other century that probably should be uh, revitalized uh, at the beginning of this uh, this century to understand again a bit more how to make the future of international cooperation a present and a reality. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, Uta. Hi, it's uh, it's Katya. I just yes, wanted to hello. Um, I wanted just to share with you the my realization during your speech. It's interesting because this the center for harmonizing and the energy of will. It's somehow brought the understanding that uh, one of the most important. I don't know even how to call that things, but um, issues of for harmonizing is the difference of the logic. Because if we are developing as a mental entity, different nations start using different logic and different values, of course, but values are clear. It's been from the very beginning, the different development of values, I would say. So the importance of the use of the law and the capacity to harmonize those different logical positions and thought forms seems to be very important. I see it's a very important part of the UN work. And um, so thank you for bringing attention to that. And if you have a comment on that, Marco, that would be you know, interesting. Yes, for me, um, law, I mean, I, I do have a legal background, but I think that uh, um, that was rather an opportunity for me to to have to spend time on this question of law, so to say. But I must confess that has been not through my legal studies, but through study of psychology, and other the study of nature that I realized this question called the law, uh, which of course in my mind was very prominent as a human thing, in fact was just the product of the fact that the consciousness of the universe, the consciousness of the planet, uh, was manifesting a system of laws. I mean, the existence of the of the planet was based on a system of laws. Uh, and at the same time, I was looking around myself and, 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 and I couldn't see, at least my, my consciousness doesn't get it yet, whether the other kingdoms uh, in nature, uh, they also have the same uh, legislative power. So in, I, I, I came to realize that you, that human beings, through the uh, the power of discrimination, 
through the power of choice. Uh, we also acquired the power to legislate. Now, the power to legislate uh, is uh, it, it can be used in different ways, but it's definitely very powerful if we can connect that power to a higher purpose. And that is the purpose of a community, for instance, is the purpose of a nation, is the purpose of the collective. So it's really enacting uh, a set of uh, rules, and it also does entail imagination, because a certain situation which has uh, certain challenges, and in order to address those challenges, you devise a set of rules that uh, force, quote-unquote, in inverted commas, a collective to stop behaving in a certain way, start behaving in another one, with the understanding that that behavior will take that community from point A to point B. Point B is the new point that we have uh, imagined. So, in, in legislation, there is this uh, imaginative power uh, embedded in it, but not necessarily always that visible. But it's definitely something that we can relate to. So if we look at ourselves as uh, uh, people that cast a ballot, people that vote, you can see how immediately you can regain control or you can demand a better exercise of the legislative power. Because there is a power that has more power than what we really normally understand and feel about. So it's an issue of also personal responsibility. So this also brings us to, to the question of politics and, and, and to the question that we really have to devote as individuals a, a much stronger attention to the real meaning and purpose of politics and to behave as politicians in our daily life, politicians with a capital P in terms of a, of a very important function that each individual human being has. So politicians is not just a job that somebody in, in, in act is really an inner function that we do have is connected to a sense of purpose, is connected to a sense of directions. And, and legislative power is connected to that. So it's incumbent on us as human as individuals to to exercise it and to make sure that it gets exercised in the right way, collectively. Thank you, Marco. And uh, just to, uh, I th it's a time for us, I think, to go into meditation. And just when I read the last comment that uh, came, uh, it's from Antrucci. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. It has helped me to understand the purpose and potential of the UN in a deeper, more organic way. And thank you for your efforts to help humanity move into more harmony, understanding, and mutual respect. Thank you. So, Marco, would you please lead us in a meditation? We have not that much time left, but at least we could have a collective focused. What up? Um, how long should that be, uh, Sasha? Um, so usually our webinars it's hour and a half, so we like we have like ten minutes, but I think it's can be uh, more just whatever feels right, what it feels organic with the flow. Don't interrupt it. Okay. Um, well, maybe okay. We can do something uh, maybe simple, but that can. Uh, um, Connect us, uh, connect us all. So I would invite uh, everybody to uh, to bring the, the conscious attentions toward uh, our inner dimensions. To acquire very calm and rhythmic breathing. And then to 
imagine a flame at the center of our heart becoming larger and larger and forming a, a major ring of light and fire connecting us all. And then from within the field of fire, we can elevate our consciousness at the center point above our heads, at the center of this circle. And that center represents our common endeavor. Which we can take today as to be a center for harmonizing actions for the common good. And I would invite to stay that center for a few minutes. Creatively imagining what to be a center for harmonizing action for the good of humanity means and entails. the use of will, the manifestation of goodwill in action. Thank <laughs> you. 
And now from this point of consciousness, we can imagine this room, which is placed beside the United Nations General Assembly. The meditation room where at the center of the room is placed a, a stone made of iron ore which can be imagined as a magnet that we can charge with the power of thought and the power of goodwill that we all have. And let's imagine a very powerful radiation emanating from this iron ore block and pervading the environment of the United Nations General Assembly all those who serve there and the peoples that they represent and through their presence their consciousness to facilitate the propagation of such power across the globe and reconnect with the power of goodwill that is manifested on a daily basis at the very community level by many, many individuals and also beings of other kings and of nature, including the animal kingdoms and the vegetable kingdoms, which also contribute to our lives. So we can imagine this very powerful stream of energy going from the iron ore block charged with goodwill and vision on one side and on the other side the goodwill of people in every single community. And the power of that connection determines the liberation of humanity, the unleashment of its potentials and its duty, the liberation of the animal kingdoms by the sufferings that it's exposed to at the moment. Same for the vegetable kingdoms. so that humanity also sees itself as a resource for them and for the collective growth of the planet and the unfoldment of the plan.
And now gradually we can come back to here and now and preserving in our hearts and minds the power and the energy of these images and the recognitions of the work that is taking place with the commitment to nurture it on a daily basis, personally. Thank you. And let's together sound the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sasha, and thanks to everybody. It's been a pleasure for me and an opportunity. There is a uh, comment from Avon Madison who wrote, Thank you, dear Marco, for this timely and relevant wisdom. In light of current crisis, the approaching uh, culmination of Conference on Sustainable Development Goals and Climate Change in Paris and the evolving role and the purpose of humanity, the United Nations, and all life in light of the divine plan. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Ava. And I want to invite you to join our uh, next webinars, coming webinars on December 14. Please join a new moon webinar, uh, which is a part of the Cyclic Meditation Project. And uh, on December 23rd, please join the Capricorn Solar Festival webinar, 
which will be focalized by the Hekal group from Jerusalem, Hekal group in France, and the theme of our meditation, collective meditation, will be, will reach into the light and bring it down to meet the need. Thank you. Let's stay connected. <laughs> 